in 2004, I was 24 years old and I was already looking at uh, a life sentence in prison. I was uh, down in the court cells in Truro and my solicitor gave me the bad news that this was my third violent offence that I was being tried for and if I was found guilty then I would be looking at a life sentence. This, uh, this shocked me. I'd, uh, I'd stumbled my way into being one of the people in society that uh, you know society wants to get rid of and, and to lock up. Um, although my crimes weren't against members of the public in general, um, you know they were against people. So the government had had enough of me, uh, the police had had enough of me, and, uh, and obviously my, my uh, community had had enough of me, and they were looking to send me away. Luckily I got not guilty, and I, and I didn't have to, uh, to do that sentence. But like I say, there's plenty of people around me um, that were doing them. And I got a message from one of my, one of my listeners recently, um, who I'm hoping to do an interview with soon, um, about the effects of this, you know, the life sentence had on him. His, one of his friends has just been sentenced to 20 years, um, a life sentence with a 20-year tariff. Um, so he'll be possibly looking at 20 to 25 years before he, uh, before he gets released. Um, that's going to have a massive effect on not only him, but his friends, his family and everything. So hopefully I'll do a, an interview with him in a podcast soon and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at that one. But it did inspire me to just maybe have a, a little chat about the people in my life that are doing Life Behind Bars as well. So um, after, you know, like I say, I was lucky to dodge my, my life sentence, but uh, my uncle at the moment is doing 19 years for murder. Um, he uh, he's a bit of a bum and uh, he takes heroin and he mixes in the kind of circles that you'd expect of kind of uh, you know heroin users and, and things in a, in a you know in town and he um, he ended up robbing someone and it went wrong uh, this guy basically owed him money for a few parcels of tobacco and he didn't pay him so my uncle went round there with a knife to go and settle the score and uh, and ended up killing him he took some stuff out of the house to make it look like it was a you know a burglary gone wrong but then he you know he put the stuff down the drain just outside the house so it was all found and along with the knife and and everything as well so he was caught and he was sentenced to 19 years um i didn't have much to do with him uh you know because of his heroin use um, it really changed, obviously, the person he was. I remember when I was a kid, because he was the youngest of my family. My my mum was one of something like 12 or 15 kids, something like that, you know, an old school family. Um, and my uncle was the youngest of the kids. My mum was the oldest of them and my uncle was the youngest of them. And I enjoyed playing football with him. I remember we went up to London and uh, we went out for, with him and his mates. You know, they were in their 20s when we were, uh, you know, when I was when I was about six or seven so uh yeah him and his uh him and his mates were were good fun and young and i remember going out and playing football with him i have great memories of him but then obviously he uh you know he went down the wrong way went down the wrong path of drugs you know as they do and it and it took him it changed who he was and uh, he ended up robbing from the family and stuff and and he had to move away he moved out of the area um i had his prison number after he got sentenced and I really wanted to um really wanted to write to him and I still do you know he's been away now for 15 years so he's been away for a long time has he been away for 15 years yeah he must have been now yeah he's been away for 15 years out of that 19 year sentence so I know that as soon as I start writing to him now he's going to be looking at an address for his parole so he can get out so you know he might be all just chummy with me and pally with me because he needs an address um after 15 years of him being in prison i haven't written to him yet so i'm sure he's getting on just fine but um yeah i don't know i don't know what to do about that one um but yeah um one of my other friends um ended up doing life in prison <clears throat> he got something like an 11 year tariff he um, got into a fight in Newquay. Um, this this lad had been sleeping with his girlfriend, so he uh, he just did what most blokes do and ended up getting into a fight with him outside a pub. 
Um, he beat the crap out of him. Um, he uh, the, the bloke wasn't in a good way. And then out of nowhere, just some random guy just came over and, you know, while, while my friend had sort of, you know, knocked this chap to the ground, this other bloke came over and just booted him in the head while he was while he was on the floor. And um, between the two of them, you know, either the kick to the head or the or the beating that my friend had just given him, uh, the guy on the floor died. He died from his injuries. And uh, the two of them ended up going to prison together and being co-defendants, even though they didn't know each other. It's just that that action in time, that that crazy fifteen minutes of uh, of scenario outside a bar in Newquay that that changed all three of their lives. And, uh, you know, the third person was odd. You know, it just happens so often that people get sucked into these fights and, you know, and now he's doing life in prison along with uh, with my friend. Um, I was was in prison with him for his trial and everything and, you know, before and after. And uh, it, it was, it was, it's very tolling on him it's very um it takes a great toll on you being on you know going up for trial for these sort of things because the trial went on for ages you know it went on for sort of three weeks or so um you know and every day you have to go back to prison you sit there you kind of you know digest what's happened that day you know you try and get a bit of food um try and get your head down and then get up again the next day and then you've got to go back down to your local area you know back in your suit again stand back up in front of everyone uh, sometimes there's big thick plastic so you can't really hear what's going on but you know you get to look over to the uh to the dock and you know you see the friends and family of you you see the friends and family of your you know your victim and then you see maybe some other people who are just sitting in there for something to do for the day you know there might be uh, a few students in there who are doing a you know a crime fucking whatever it is a level and uh yeah, it's an odd experience. And then, again, you're back to the prison, back out, back into the prison, back out. And obviously you're reliving your crime in great detail. So, again, all this bravado and tough guy image you might have in jail suddenly gets all just chipped away and you're, you know, you're exposed and you're, um, you're raw back with the, the real world again just for a taste, just for a few hours and then you're thrown back in prison. Uh, once again, now I'm not saying that you know my friend did wrong and he and he shouldn't be um, he shouldn't be you know in prison for life. It's not not that the process was wrong, but I'm just saying from my from my side from the inside looking at him, it took a big toll on him having to go in and out every day, and um, also there was arguments between him and this other guy, you know the third guy, who just came up and booted him in the head because my friend wanted to go not guilty because he thought that his actions didn't actually kill the guy it was the third party that got the uh you know who put the boot in that killed him whereas the 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 guy who kicked him in the head wanted to go guilty so he'd get a lesser sentence um so you know i remember there being a lot of trouble between the two lads um in prison as well they weren't exactly friends um but they still had to go on trial together um one of the guys i met who was doing life in prison um i was actually I met him in the kitchens um in, in Dartmoor and he was doing a long time in prison he knew he wasn't getting out he'd already been in there for something like 20 odd 20 years when I when I met him um, he was an old school prisoner uh, he, he didn't have much time for the young lads um, or any fucking around really he had put himself in a mental hospital for a while so he put himself in Broadmoor um, just for something to do he said because he knew he was going to be in prison for the rest of his life so he started to act up, act mental, um, got himself sectioned, got himself sent to Broadmoor. And he did uh, a number of years in Broadmoor. And then obviously, you know, pretended again to be sane and, and got released and and then went back into, you know, normal prison life. Now, these kind of prisons always, you know, just made me a little bit worried and a little bit nervous because, you know, you're always around people who have their boundaries and have their lines. But... These kind of prisoners who, you know, have nothing to lose, you know, just even just spending six months down the block is just a holiday for these guys. You know, he, you know, he may have a, a 10 or 20 year plan of touring other prisons and maybe doing an A cat or a D cat. Who knows? Who knows what's in this fucking guy's mind? <laughs> but it's uh, it's certainly going to be every day of it in prison. 
Um, so, you know, smashing you up and stabbing you just because you burnt his food um, was was absolutely nothing to these some of these people. And that would always uh, be in the back of my mind when you're having these interactions with guys. Um, one of them I met was, was one of the nicest men I, I, I'd ever met. Um, I used to take the piss a little bit because he was... He was a. Sh he looked like a short version of Lewis Hamilton's dad. Um, any of you that uh, follow Formula One um, will know Lewis Hamilton's dad. And uh, yeah, this guy looked like a you know sort of like a five foot two version of him. Um, again, in for murder. I think he he was doing something like nineteen years. Um, but uh, he was just one of the nicest people I ever met. And you know he he was really into his gym, really into his training and things. And and. Uh, it was, you know, he was one of the people that I was always shocked uh, was in prison because if you met him on the outside, you would expect to see him at some sort of, you know, football match, a soccer game or something, um, you know, being around the kids, you know, at some sort of dad's event, you know, that sort of thing. And he wouldn't look out of place and you would just expect him to be just some sort of community guy. Um, but here he was just in prison and, and uh, you know, possibly outcast from society for, for what he did. And it's uh, again. It's I'm not saying that you shouldn't be there, but you know, there's 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 people who should be in prison and there's people who shouldn't. You know, and uh, there needs to be a better way of working out who who should be where. Um, one of the people I used to listen to him when he um, uh, he was going for his appeal, and again, this sort of thing, it was it was some sort of court. Um, he had to spend about a week there giving evidence and stuff for his appeal. And he possibly did do it, you know. But he was coming to me every night, speaking to me and saying about how he's, you know, how he's um, feeling really depressed about uh, the whole appeal process and things and going, you know, dragging up all the old trial and all the old talking about it. This guy had, you know, supposedly killed his wife, um and uh, well, that's what he was in prison for he's, he you know he's in prison for killing his wife and then you know dumping the body in some woodlands nearby and i had to listen to him while he you know protested his innocence to me but um you know i read about it in the papers and things and you know the papers were saying that it was open and shut you know this guy definitely did do it and you know there's evidence to back up the facts that he did it and you know and and then I see the other side of it. I see the prisoner on the inside who's sat there crying in my cell, you know, trying to get you know his point across and 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 trying to appeal the evidence that says he did it so surely. Um, I don't know, you know, maybe prison's the best place for him. I don't I don't know if he truly did it or not. But um, you know, the evidence said he did, and uh, and that's the reality of it. But um, from the human point of view, you know, I used to have to listen to him crying at night. And uh, trying to relieve those those problems from him, um, you know, just on a human level, and uh, you know he's got to live the rest of his life in prison um, because of that, whether he did it or not. And one of my friends, when I back in two thousand and four, you know, when I just managed to dodge that IPP, I still had to do a little bit of time in prison. Um, and one of my friends at that point, he'd just been sentenced. Um, he got uh, a six-year IPP. Um, imprisonment, imprisonment for public protection is what IPP stands for. Sorry if anyone's uh, worried, uh, wor wondering um, what it meant. Um, again, it's, it's exactly like a life sentence. You basically get a tariff, um, but then you are on license for the rest of your life. Uh, so in theory, they can keep you in prison for as long as they want to. Um, and then you're, when you're out, you're out on license for the rest of your life. Um, and then they can uh, obviously call you back at any time. Uh, my friend has only just finished. They've, they've completely closed off his case, so he's got no more license to do. Um, Fifteen years later, um, he's been on license now, and he's just they've just finished it all off. Um, so yeah, he had six years in prison, and then uh, a fifteen-year license. They uh, they deemed it as because they've scrapped the IPPs now, um, so uh, they must have scrapped all the the life licenses as well. But uh, yeah. I would have been in. I would have been in, in exactly the same boat as him. You know, I would have been looking at a long time in prison um, and on a long time on license. Because, again, like I say, I broke every bit of trust I, I was ever given. Um, life in prison is a weird one um, because, again, it, it doesn't always mean life in prison. Um, a life sentence, sorry, um, doesn't always mean life in prison. One of the shortest life sentences I saw um, was three and a half years. 
Uh, so the guy only had to do three and a half years in prison, and then he went for his uh, his parole. Um, and he got out straight away. It was kind of it was he'd killed someone, but it was killing someone defending his his girlfriend. Um, and there was some CCTV that backed it up, so they had to give him a life sentence. Um, but uh, yeah, they they still he still got uh, quite a short time. Um, I've seen other people get four and a half year tariffs. Um, so let me just explain what that means. So um, the tariff is the time that you actually get. So what the judge gives you. So in the case of my listener, the tariff would be you know the twenty year sentence. But that's just the parole date, basically. Um, so when you get to that time, you then sit in front of the parole board. Sometimes it's a bit like the one you see on telly, where you physically sit in front of a parole board um, and talk to them. Other times it can be all done behind closed doors. Um, I know all my parole boards were basically, you know. Um, all the meetings happen and all the reports are done and then they're just sent to a bunch of people who sit in a room um, and talk about you. Um, you don't physically sit or stand in front of a board of people. Um, but every, uh, if you don't get your parole, um, they'll set a date for a review. That could be once every year, once every two years. Um, you know, but you can go through several re reviews. Um, most people doing a life sentence kind of just know that you're going to do at least three reviews um, before you actually get your, your, you know, your, your release date. Uh, because parole boards are very nervous um, and very jittery. They don't ever want to be seen to be too keen on letting someone out um, who may have co committed some sort of horrific crime. Um, so they never want to be seen to be the parole or probation uh, member who let somebody out at the very first opportunity when they got a life sentence. So you may end up looking at two or three different reviews um, before you even get considered for a, for release. Um so yeah, that's basically it. Um, I thought I would read out some stuff about lifers in the UK, but uh, as I read so badly, um, I thought I would uh, not bother with that. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening. Um, obviously, if you want to, uh, if you want me to do any other videos, just hit me up in the comments. Um, if you haven't subscribed and you're all the way here, then please do subscribe. Um, these videos are great. Um, and uh, there's going to be more and more of them and um, yeah I'll make another one soon and, and get it out alright so yeah thank you very much for listening um, and uh, we'll, we'll speak again soon thank you <laughs>